why do you bother to lovingly coach your children for Little League and make sure their mask is over their nose and make sure they go to the best school they can get to if on the macro through your politics you are sending them into a world that essentially has no space for their flourishing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What is the point of catching a ball well on a planet you can't live on? This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Anand Giridardas, who wrote a book that, I would say, turned me inside out a couple, a few years ago. Winner Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World, kind of, how do I say, it, it raised so many questions that I, I actually think are even more vivid now and in need of exploration as a result of the pandemic and some of the other things that we've experienced that have been so unsettling for society, both in the United States and around the world. Anand, thank you for joining me today. I'm just happy I, uh, to be with you again. It's very, uh, it's very powerful. What I will call the the kind of uh, the musical inspiration, not necessarily the lyrics, but when I was thinking about today, I kept hearing this song that Bob Dylan wrote last year called "I Contain Multitudes," and in many ways, the many multi-dimensionality of awareness, psychological, political, how media and various institutions work. I, I just see you, you have a lateral pattern recognition type skill that's extraordinary. And I hope my young scholars will not only tune in today, but continue to learn from you. I know you have a, a very nourishing substack site on uh, called The Inc, which I subscribe to. and. Uh, I not only enjoy you, I enjoy the people you attract to that site, and I hope it continues to thrive. Well, thank you. That, I, but, I appreciate it. I, I remember our first conversation from three or four years ago, and it, it, still, it still stands out to me. So glad to be back in uh, conversation with you. Yeah, and I would say to you, given having worked in government in the private sector with very wealthy billionaires, etc., throughout my life, you're helping me navigate on my path and how would I say, unmask within my own heart what I think goodness is as opposed to dodging and avoiding things. And as you know, when you avoid things, you end up in a crisis. you gotta, you got to embrace the challenges. So right now, we're coming through a pandemic of fear that the Biden administration is losing momentum as the midterm elections approach in the United States. We're seeing a lot of concern about U.S.-China relations. We're seeing a lot of concern about the Ukraine. And we're seeing a lot of anxiety. I, I just made a podcast with A.J. Chibber about the reinvigoration of India. And I know, my, I think I remember from our first time talking, my mother grew up in Rocky River, Ohio. And I think you said something like you were born in Cleveland or lived in Cleveland, and I knew you were a Wolverine at one point uh, at the University of Michigan, it's where my dad went to college. But I, I just remember th thinking that you had been in Mumbai, though that's not where you started, it, and, and then to the New York Times, which I think where you, you were coming out of when we first met. But from those different backgrounds, those different places, Cleveland, Detroit, and Arbor, that wasn't a part of the world. I used to say that that's, that's the region of the world America divorced when the auto industry went down. They didn't come to the assistance. And when you're thinking of healing now, seeing what's happening, seeing the dysfunction, seeing the attraction to authoritarian alternative, what's the picture you would paint of the, what you might call the, the road and the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I'm glad we're <clears throat> glad we're doing an easy start, an easy on ramp uh, for this <laughs> interview. Um, look, I, I think this could not be a moment of higher stakes. You know, this is a moment where, and not just high stakes on one thing, 
or two things or three things. This is a uh, moment in time in which some of the most vital questions of how we are going to live together within the United States, in the family of nations, um, are up for grabs. And there is a wider range of answers possible on offer for people, possible, could be you know, um, in place in five years or 10 years or 20 years, um, then I think is typically possible uh, in, a, in a given era. So just to take a few, you know, climate. It is genuinely possible that we will make choices that allow the planet to be a place we can continue to live. Mm -hmm. And it is genuinely possible that we will not make choices to keep the world being a habitable place to live, and it will no longer be a habitable place. And I can't tell you, nor can you tell me, which of those we're going to do, yeah. right? That is a live discussion and contest. The, the, the end of civilization on Earth, or should, we, or should we keep going? That is a, I mean, in, in how many eras has that been a live mm -hmm. fraught subject of, of deliberation? But it is. Yes. Um, we are in a conversation in the United States, and not only in the United States, about whether we should attempt to realize the promise of democracy um, in this country, be a liberal democracy that has peaceful transitions of power through uh, respecting the will of the people in elections, or whether maybe we should not be that. Again, mm -hmm. in your and my life, there haven't been that many moments when that kind of question, should we do peaceful transitions of power or should we not, has been elevated literally to the presented in that way with a kind of 50 50 view on it in the country um we are having a reckoning around race and understanding the bone deep nature of racism in this country in a way that has normally been you know buried marginalized hidden in in subtext talked around through these kind of proxy, you know, coded things like deficits and welfare and these kind of issues that allow people to talk about race without talking about race. Well, that's over. We are now explicitly talking about, you know, uh, a kind of things like the 1619 Project, views of the United States mm -hmm. as being um, flawed from the beginning in their, in their endemic racism. And on the other hand, the attempts to kind of purge honest history, have book bans, ban critical race theory, and these other useful contributions to understanding ourselves. Um, so we're not having a 1990s like welfare argument as a pro. We are talking about whether we are an irredeemably racist country, or whether anybody who thinks we are a racist country should essentially be banned from teaching and banned from public mm -hmm. life in different ways. So. On that level, again, we are having the highest stakes version of the argument. With COVID, you know, we have really had dramatized the questions around what kind of economy and safety net and, and the basic question of what we owe each other. Are we a society that leaves people to their own devices? Which again, has always kind of been uh, the question, but has been really dramatized when for a lot of people, just work was taken away for a two year period. Uh, opportunity was taken away, homes were taken away. Um, and on the other hand, people arguing with a new skip in their step because of the, the teaching moment of the last two years, that there is a case for having real solidarity in this country, for doing things mm -hmm. like healthcare together, for having real labor protection. Um, you know, with the Ukraine-Russia situation, and I think the Afghanistan withdrawal some months earlier, we are facing a real question about what does the world look like when the country that has in recent decades, in your and my lifetime, been the self-appointed uh, kind of arbiter of the Pax Americana that was named after it. Uh, what happens when that country, our country, still kind of remains the only country that can throw its weight around on a situation like Russia, that can uh, you know, try to beat back the terrible things Vladimir Putin is doing, but at the same time is a country that is kind of stripped of all authority to say anything about anything to anyone else. Uh, it's just not clear who the hell we are, what our standing is yes. in the world. If 
if we don't even do peaceful transfers of power anymore as a kind of guaranteed bedrock thing, what are we talking about when we talk about democracy around the mm -hmm. world? Um, if we, you know, don't, if we cannot go into a society like Afghanistan 20 years and understand that country with the, the, just the barest enough understanding of social dynamics in that society, that frankly, every writer I know who moved to that country and wrote a book about it understood it much better than the entire security apparatus of the United States that spent 20 <laughs> years and trillions of dollars attempting to understand it. Like literally every writer who went there understood it on their own, mm -hmm. just by walking around and talking to people. So I don't understand the trillions of dollars we spent trying to not understand it. But if, we don't, if we're not able to understand a society like Afghanistan in a way to have basically any influence there, um, besides s s bleeding money there, then what gives us an understanding about how to out-strategize Vladimir Putin? What mm -hmm. gives us uh, any kind of insight into what is actually motivating the Chinese? Um, so we could go on, but on every level, what mm -hmm. I see is the highest stakes imaginable. And the last thing I'll say is I think there was a way that you could listen to what I just said over the last few minutes as saying uh, as a case for despair. But I actually think if you, if you heard the kind of various versions of the dilemmas, they all contain a very positive <laughs> uh, potential scenario mm -hmm. also. And I am not mm -hmm. clear which way we're going to go. I, I mm -hmm. think we could come out of COVID with a new understanding of the safety net. I think we could come out of COVID with a, a desire to bring down plutocracy in a way that there wasn't when you and I talked last on this show. Um, mm -hmm. I think there is a possibility that climate change will wake us up not only to beating back climate change, but to creating a way of living with the planet and with each other that is better than the way we've ever lived with each other and the planet before. I think it is possible that we come out of Afghanistan, we deal with this Russia situation in a way that has actually more humility because we understand what we don't understand. And we realize that, you know, if you are not a strong democracy at home, it really limits your ability to talk about protecting other democracies. Um, there is in each of these scenarios a, a, a hope that this is actually one of those moments in societies, I think like the moment coming out of World War One, the moment coming out of World War Two, where there is actually this greater than usual space to rethink, to reimagine, to build something different, to go a different way. Um, and I think the other half of each of those dilemmas is that we may really mess it up. And we may be the people who made the planet, you know, go to hell, um, mm -hmm. who, who basically squandered whatever measure of democracy we had, um, and who left life worse uh, for everybody who was to come after us. And that is a existed. real and, 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 and fraught choice that I think haunts yeah. us on every level of, of political question we have. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm always informed by musical lyrics as I listen to my guests. Bob Dylan in 1962, at a time when the Sputnik uh, polarity and fear of nuclear war arose, had a song called Masters of War. You've thrown the worst fear that can ever be hurled, fear to bring children into the world. For threatening my baby, unborn and unnamed, you ain't worth the blood that runs in your veins. That fear, like you said, crisis is opportunity. But people like Daniel Ellsberg, who had done a very nice job, I made a three-part series for my young scholars with him last year, have talked about with the scale and size of these arsenals, if these people unleash on each other, we'd destroy the upper atmosphere and 95% of life on Earth. And he's not what you might call conjectural. These are things that are published in Nature and Science magazine. And they're... In other words, the dispassionate experts in some realms of this science see the danger of nuclear war, which was always hideous vis-a-vis -vis the two places fighting, but it's now a planetary destruction. That makes me worry a little bit about the Taiwan Straits or Ukraine. You've got all of these um, very, very, uh, what you might call Lots of momentum in the political economy. The strength of pharma and insurance making America, medical care in America cost about twice what it does for everybody per capita in the OECD 
but being ranked by the World Health Organization as 38th in quality. There are better models existing that we're not emulating. And I don't, I don't understand all the sources of resistance. You know, you mentioned the notion plutocracy. And I don't understand, how would I say, uh, how, how you let things go down the drain while making money. When you're talking about the stakes being as high as you are, nuclear war, climate destruction, how can you not shift gears? I understand uh, from listening to one of your earlier audio uh, podcasts that you have two children. I've got four children and two grandchildren. Th that's really something worth fighting for. And it it's is. not just about money. And uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, there the, are people the, from my generation. I mean, I, I don't take this view, but there are people from my generation, people I know and respect, who otherwise want children but are not having them because of the nature of the world that those yeah, children the would dread, be in. Yeah. And again, that's an individual choice, a private choice, and who knows what else may be going on there. But, uh, you know, and while it's not a choice I share, I think it's a, it's a wake-up call. What kind of what does it say about our stewardship of mm -hmm. our institutions, the society, the world, um, that people are not confident it would be ethical to introduce a human being mm -hmm. into it? Dylan has a lyric in that same song. Let me ask you a question. Is your money that good? Will it buy you forgiveness? Do you think that it could? I think you will find when your death takes its toll, all the money you made will never buy back your soul. That's that's sounds like he shares my views on philanthropy. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and this uh, how you say doing good and doing well. The question is, doing well financially, accompanied by doing good, is that f doing good or feeling good about your intent? Yeah, I mean, you know, to, to I think to step back, we have all these problems. A lot of these problems that these these they have multiple causes, but a very common cause behind a lot of them is the richest and most powerful people wanting to run this society like a casino where they're the only people who win. And that shows up in why we don't have health care. It shows up in why we don't have a safety net. They would rather not pay taxes, pay what they owe. Um, it shows up in why we are so ready to go to war uh, and so loath to make peace. It shows up in um, the kind of, you know, uh, kneecapping of Joe Biden's agenda to, um, you know, spend a lot of money protecting uh, th this country and the world against climate change and, and, you know, tightening the safety net and so on and so forth. And the very same plutocratic forces, the billionaire class, the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk's and others of, the, of that ilk, who have spent this pandemic seeing their fortunes um, just mushroom, mm -hmm. uh, will do everything they can to resist any checks on their wealth and power, resist anti-monopoly scrutiny, resist regulation. You see Elon Musk taking government uh, money for his projects and then, and then you know, decrying government spending as an ingrate, um, so on mm -hmm. and so forth. And then, to your point, they turn around having plundered uh, having gut punched the state that is really the best chance the rest of us have to have something of a level playing field with them. And then they turn around and they say they want to do well by doing good. They actually want to help us. Rob, didn't you know they want to help us? They want to, they want to give back. They want to change the world. They want to make the world a better place. They want to solve this problem. They want to solve that problem. Um, you have Jeff Bezos uh, not long ago donating money to create a free preschool for poor children. Another way to say poor children is the children of the people Jeff Bezos and people like him underpay. Mm -hmm. um, so you build a fortune um, in this way where you cut every moral corner you can, mm -hmm. um, you underpay people if you can, you underpay taxes if you can, you avoid regulation, you avoid uh, antitrust scrutiny, you avoid, you avoid, you avoid, you take the surplus profits 
that you make doing that and pump it back into the political pro- a, a slice of it back into the political process, buying donations to buy off politicians from both parties so that they don't, uh, you know, catch buying you in the, the Washington end. Post. Exactly. <laughs> you just get a newspaper if you want. Um, and then you launder your reputation using the drive-through reputational laundromat of philanthropy. You start a foundation, you give back, and you turn yourself in the public imagination, in the eyes of enough people, into not only not the problem, into the solution, the deliverance. You are now, if we're going to have racial justice in this country, you are now a funder of it. You are now someone racial justice organizations need to fund your efforts. Uh, If we're going to have you know, new economic ideas. You are someone who is going to get a phone call to support those ideas. If we're, if we're going to have, uh, you know, a kind of uh, renewed worker uh, social contract around work and workers and unions, you're going to be someone funding those initiatives. And so you become the person kind of most at risk of being resented for uh, deforming this society becomes the savior, or at least the person people cannot pretend is, you know, can, cannot be honest about not being the savior. Um, and so it is a remarkable game they play, and it's a game that I tried to expose and explain in Winners Take All. Mm-hmm. And I will say four years later, thanks to any number of, you know, larger forces in American life, um, and I think above all the pandemic, I think that has become much clearer to people. I think the pandemic in particular made it clear to people that while literally everybody else was suffering and struggling, um, yes. there was this group of plutes at the top grabbing and hoarding and living, living their, best, their best eras. Um, and that actually does give me hope that there has been more clarity around that. I, I think the average kind of, the average person's I felt this very strongly when I was writing Winners Take All and even talking to people about it in the aftermath of it. I think often I would encounter people, very average Americans, whose kind of reflexive feeling about the billionaire was not any particular one, just kind of the average billionaire, (laughs) average person's attitude to the average billionaire was like, yeah, they work really hard and they're very lucky and yeah, they should probably like pay more of their fair share, but like, you know, like... Not got to uh, reward kind of their innocent. talent, yeah. Right, that they were kind of innocent until proven guilty, and that they must had they must have done something right. And I would say, as I look at the culture now, I feel like the average person's reflex on who and what a billionaire is is someone who did something personally or systemically shady to get in that situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I and. I may not be right, and it'd be interesting to, to do opinion polling on it, you know, but there, there has been some favorable polling already that I've seen. I think there has been a real shift in how the average American conceives of their plutocratic overlords, um, yes. conceiving them as people who not just, don't just happen to be kind of high above them, but people who are high above because they're kind of standing on them. Uh, and I think some of the mechanisms of standing have become clearer to people. And that actually gives me quite a bit of hope. There's a kind of dilemma that I've talked about with some of the other guests on this podcast, which was, I'll just start with, in the era of FDR and others, there were people who believed in markets, but thought the state was always a source of inefficiency and corruption. On the other side of the pendulum, there were people who believed in the state and thought that you needed to, with whether it's antitrust or whatever, constrain concentrations of wealth and power. What I saw during the uh, Obama years with the great financial crisis, and as Joe Stiglitz often said, the polluters got paid in the bailout, was a cynicism develop on both left and right. And there was a very uh, kind of tense situation and there was a gentleman named Stuart Zeckman who I've talked to online and and on the phone but I've never met. He was a musical artist in New York and he talked about how the Obama administration said we can't go back to being like FDR because nobody trusts the government and he went into the Gallup polls which were the source of this person's anonymous presentation I believe it was on Politico and he said 
when you read the Gallup report, it's they don't trust the government because they don't think the government governs the powerful structures, the plutocrats and the corporations. They think that they are subordinates now, and they are captured and they are <coughs> accelerating, amplifying the concentration of power. And I guess where I'm going with this in, in a question to you is the fear of that process creates a despair because nobody thinks there's any place to go to heal things. And you see uh, people like Donald Trump getting elected saying the system is rigged and people reacting to that positively. I read an essay that you wrote a little while ago and you said we live in a time in which generosity has come to function as a wingman to injustice in many cases, which giving back has come to function as a wingman to taking too much, and which talking about changing the world is all too often serving as a wingman for keeping your world at the top the same. So that's that resistance from plutocracy. But then what you recommend later in another writing is part of what I'm here to say, whether you like it or not, is that it is much more important, in my view, to make bad harder. It requires doing it over people's objections. It requires kicking and screaming from the owners, CEOs, and investors. It requires doing things they hate to see to, to achieve a fairer society. And so the question at some level is, I'm, 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 is I'm seeing this distrust in government. I'm wondering what organization, what institutional force or collective we can put together to create that counterbalance to the plutocratic capture and control? Uh, I actually don't think that's possible. I think you can't, I, I, I don't think the capture of government and the discrediting of government is a reason to, to do an alternative to government. I think you just have to take your government back. Um, okay. You know, it, it's a little bit the way I see my family. When I have problems with my family, I, I don't get another family. I, uh, maybe if they got really bad, you got you got to fix the problems in your family because they're your family, um, and the government is you know is us. And the, one of the last lines of my book is the government is us. And Joe Biden said something similar uh, in March 2021 after he took office. Un unlikely for you know a, a guy who was much more of a centrist, moderate Democrat to the government is us. So. This right-wing notion that the government is this kind of foreign occupying force in a society that is, um, that is hostile to the interests of people, um, that's a right-wing talking point that, as you say, has in some ways found a certain kind of mirror image purchase on the, on the left, understandably, which is kind of that, you know, if government is fully bought and paid for by the plutocrats, there can be a kind of anti-government sentiment on the left uh, as well. But I think at the end of the day, if we're talking about how do you deliver this country from the legacy of 400 years of racial plunder and, and injustice embedded in every system and fabric of this country, if you're asking a question of how do you make the planet habitable or not, uh, if you're dealing with a question of how do you empower women through policy to play all of the roles they can play and want to play, uh, if you're asking a question like what does a modern safety net look like in the age of Grubhub and Uber and a kind of precariat app economy. If you're asking those kinds of questions, the only answer, the only kinds of solutions are public, democratic, institutional, and universal solutions. Uh, as the feminists mm -hmm. said uh, a generation ago, there are no personal solutions at this time, only political solutions. There are no personal solutions to the precarious gig economy. There are no personal solutions to climate change, uh, whatever light bulb they may be trying to sell you. There are no personal solutions to the empowerment of women, whatever Sheryl Sandberg might be trying to tell you would lean in while she's kind of selling most women into a, into a kind of authoritarian, misogynistic uh, future. So I am a deep believer in government, but not in the government we happen to have today, in the idea of government as the only place where we can solve the biggest problems we share, because the government is us. To believe in government the way I do is simply to believe in us. I believe 
that we can come together through common institutions to solve problems the way we have in the past. Mm -hmm. I believe we are not doing that very effectively right now. I believe we can do it again. And I think it's quite clear the obstacles to doing that, which are very, very powerful people who want to divide and distract us and pit us against each other and feed us with bogus information and any number of other sins, uh, make us think they you know, uh, are, the, are the saviors when in fact they're the trouble. Um, their motives are clear, how they do it is clear, and I am trying to suggest that they are only doing this. They only go to the lengths to do this because they understand how absolutely dire it would be for them if we got our act together uh, and, and made government work for us, made it work for most people, made it serve the interests of all. Um, if that wasn't such a powerful force, uh, such a powerful mechanism for human betterment, for the achievement of solidarity, for the realization of democracy, um, they wouldn't spend so much of their time and money rigging this society. They're rigging for a reason. They're afraid of you, and you should take that seriously and do the thing they're most afraid of, which is organize through democracy for a government that fights for you and everyone like you and everyone at large. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the questions I'm often asked is, how do you get an existing legislature to vote to change let's say, the, the role of money in politics when it is actually something that gives an incumbent an advantage relative to a challenger because they have policy to sell. And uh, so there, there are obstacles. There's resistance in the way, and being mindful of that, I think, is important. But Those are the hard, you're right. Those are the hardest issues, you know, where, where the judge and jury are kind of uh, the, the guilty party. They're kind of the defendants and the judge and jury at the same time. At the same time, I would say... You know, I, I do not believe on most of those issues, including money in politics. I don't believe it's the case that we only have a problem of the people in power not wanting to do these things. It, you know, if you were to come to me with polling data that said 99% of Americans want to get rid of money in politics, right, mm -hmm. but only 40 senators out of 100, I would say, okay. And, and there may be some issues that, that you know, that... that yeah fit that bill. Um, I think in the United States of America, and this is often something I think the left doesn't confront as honestly as it could, you know, we don't just have a powerful interests problem, we often have a lay people public opinion problem. Yeah, uh, consciousness we, is we haven't won that off, argument. Off and, course, and, yeah. and, and a lot of that consciousness is, is driven by those powerful actors and the media they own and the mm -hmm. manufacturing of consent they do. But it's not just that. Um, this is a, as people have said, a center-right country. It is certainly a country with a history uh, in, many, in many communities, in many parts of the country, particularly in more rural regions, of real esteem in anti-government feeling, a real sense of, like, we're still trying to get rid of the king of Eng England, like that revolution's kind of mm -hmm. never done mm -hmm. for a lot yeah. of people. Um, that's not just the Murdoch's ginning up stuff, right? That's been with us very deeply for a very long time. This country does have a somewhat unique history of the large numbers of people who came here to get away from some other thing and the kind of people who were, who were happy to like live alone in places with zero community and zero anything, zero history, you know, that they, uh, of their communities, wiping out other communities that have been living there for a long time and trying to begin their own history there. Uh, that was a kind of weird, a weird setup that a lot of people were attracted to in Europe. Um, and so I think from the beginning, this country has had this kind of rugged individualist fantasy of, you know, kind of grafted onto this settler colonial uh, reality that I think goes deeper than our couple of corporations pushing a right wing agenda. They are, and they're shoring that thing up. But there's a very primordial American desire to be left the hell alone, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. that don't tread on me flag from from the War of Independence. That that's a right. I mean, like, is that, that a slogan from years school. ago, or is it a slogan from the American Revolution? Right. Yeah, every um, schoolroom in the world 
is repeating that year after year for our children. It's, it's, in bake, it's baked in by the time you're a young adult. And perhaps when you're anxious as a young adult, I'm, I'm always uh, citing the book of the late Jane Jacobs called Dark Age Ahead. It was the last book she wrote, published in 2004. And she said, we have to worry about when, it, when we are credentializing, not educating, because people are so afraid they're not becoming citizens. They're not trying to understand the scope of the possible. They're trying to conform to get a job. And uh, I, I'm curious what you think as a parent of young children regarding what do you hope for them to have and what would you like to see in the education system as we're growing the next generation of, of I mean, of I think the biggest, concern, the, the biggest concern I have with them is, is just the world we are leaving them overall yeah. um, feels indefensible. I and my I have a seven year old who's old enough to understand the ways in which we are leaving him in an indefensible world. He's starting to, you know, uh, ask about whether we have a gasoline car or an electric car and why <laughs> one or why the other. He's uh, he's old enough to be puzzled by a lot of the choices that adults seem to make. I mean, he was born in 2015, so the kind of a grave authoritarian threat either being kind of on the margins or in power or lurking off stage uh, has been the kind of, you know, um, dominant message of, of his lifetime. I mean, my daughter was born in 2018 and effectively has not been conscious outside of a pandemic. Um, and so, you know, she neither of them really remembers life without masks. Neither of them remembers, um, you know, a kind of moment in which voting was not, um, you know, is this like the end of the republic or not? Um, mm. So I, I, I often think about with them, um, is this the kind of moment that we can bend in a direction that will kind of redeem adults in their mind and their friends' minds. Um, because right now, I think we're, you know, we're failing them. Um, and it is not clear to me that, that my fellow parents out there, many large numbers of them, have any intention of making this the kind of world, the kind of country that their children would be proud of them for. Yes. Let me uh, share something with you, because my children were born in 2010 and 2012. Excuse me, 20, 20, 2009 and 2012. And so they're 12 and 9 now. But when my oldest of these two was, I guess, uh, 9 years old, and just as background, Naomi Klein and her husband, Avi Lewis, are friends of the family, and she, my daughter was very inspired by Greta Thunberg and so forth, but she's nine years old. I took her to the climate strike. About three weeks later, I held a board meeting of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and afterwards, a couple of the board members came over to dinner who know my daughter, and we talked about climate change. My daughter went quiet, went to bed next day, didn't talk when I drove her to school, which is very uncharacteristic. And at the end of her second hour, I got something sent on a text, which is a poem that she wrote during her study hall. What is everything? By Sarah. What is everything? Is it all essence or is it all answers? Is there more? Why am I all covered up, never seeing past or present or future? Is it all an illusion? Why is it all collapsing, destroyed, all those lives not knowing? Will we ever know? Wow. I was haunted. The, a nine-year-old child would feel that kind of weight because some of what I thought were outstanding thinkers, people like John Powell, who's at Berkeley and, and Drummond Pike, who founded the Tides Foundation, were at this dinner. She knew them 
from summer times and holidays and stuff. But she was so haunted when we talked about climate change, having done the climate strike and not seeing anything. That was a real wake-up call to me. Uh-huh. In, in the sense that I felt like I'm, I'm in this pathway in my own career and so forth, but the, the, the awareness of disorientation by a nine-year-old child was they, really quite... They, really as that poem beautifully made clear, they know what we are up to, and they know what we're not up to. And I think mm-hmm. they feel, and you, there's a lot of mental health data to back this up, I think they feel yeah. very acutely, this young generation, our failure to leave them yes. a halfway decent world. Yes. And I, I don't, it's very hard to appeal to people who are on the other side of these issues of climate and, and economic injustice, et cetera, because people feel so immovable. But even if you don't come at these issues from a policy or ideological perspective in the place I do, I think it's very important for people to realize <laughs> that their children will not respect them for the world they left their children. Um, That's right. If these trends continue. Because unfortunately, if you're a climate denier on the right, you don't get to opt out of your kids suffering from climate change. It just means you don't believe in it. Um, And your kid will one day lose a house. They may lose a house and you know, a few years, they may lose a house in 40 years when you're long gone. But your kids are going to suffer from climate change, whether or not you believe in reality. And they're going to think of you. They're going to think of you. They're going to think of how you used to watch Fox News all the time and rant about the climate hoax. And they're going to think of you as their house is burning or as the water is coming in through the windows and they're going to resent you. They might even hate you for contributing to a world in which that kind of violence was possible on them. Yes. And I think millions and millions of people need to really reckon with, apart from the ideology of this, why do you bother to lovingly coach your children for Little League and make sure their mask is over their nose and make sure they go to the best school they can get to. If on the macro through your politics, you are sending them into a world that essentially has no space for their flourishing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What is the point of catching a ball well on a planet you can't live on. And I think a lot of parents are going to need to reckon with that. Um, Not like, it's like teaching somebody how to parents. It's like teaching them how to kayak and then have them go over a waterfall. I mean, it's, it's not, it doesn't go. Or teaching them how to kayak and, and voting for there to be a world without rivers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, uh, an interesting dimension of this, you know, you're talking, I think, about a core of what's wholesome and good in America when people seem to be, which you might call, following the siren songs of temptation or plutocracy. But one of the other th- dramas that's taking place now is what I'll call the realm of Asian geopolitics, where people like Orville Schell have written the Cartesian Enlightenment way of seeing and the Eastern philosophy, Taoism and Hindu and Buddhism and so forth, are in conflict. And China, which was wounded by the Opium Wars, Japanese invasion, is trying to regain, I won't call it unilateral leadership, but at least front row partnership. And a man named uh, Kishore Mabubani has just released a book called uh, Asia 21st Century, And he essentially says in a chapter called Democracy versus Plutocracy, with the Eastern philosophy, which has a little bit more of a flavor of accepting uncertainty and common good than the individualism model 
an individual freedom like you were referring to that from our founding experience in America we trumpet. But it, it gets to the place where Mahmoudi says, do you have a republic of, by, and for the 1%? And how do you expect other countries want to get in line and follow that, given the number of people in prisons, given the problems in schools, the, given the concentration of wealth, given what the pandemic has revealed, and given the failures in climate change? I thought it was fascinating for him to, which you might call, ask the same kind of questions about the moral fabric of the society that you and I are exploring in the context of our children in terms of what is the comparative magnet that people want to aspire to. And at the same time, I just saw a film called Ascension, which was the grand prize winner at the Tribeca Film Festival, where a woman from China really made a very hard and cold film about what's happening to people who are all becoming subservient to plutocracy within China. Is that really economic development? So it, it seems like there's an awful lot of cards on the table for what I'll call reshuffling or re reorganizing at this place all over the world. I mean, I think part of what you're raising, to, to go back to the beginning of the conversation, is the question of standing. The United States... I think has a desire to be in conversations like what is the best system of government in the world. I mean, there's a lot of shy, timid countries out there. They have their system, they have their way, but they don't, they don't talk mm -hmm. about it much. They don't try to spread it. They don't have institutes promoting it. They just are who they are. You know, Bulgaria is who Bulgaria is. Bulgaria is not trying to make anybody else like Bulgaria. It's just, being Bulgaria is enough for Bulgaria. Well, we're not like that. We think we have something to say to the world. We think uh, that our system is a better system. And China, it is worth saying, I, I don't think at any moment um, you could look at the Soviet Union and say, you know, uh, as an outsider to that, um, this is providing a real question of whether uh, liberal democracy is a better system or not. But I think the rise of China has been a much more powerful um, challenge to mm -hmm. the hegemony of liberal democratic society. And I'll, and I'll say why from a kind of more personal point of view. I think the real comparison with China is not the United States, which is a very rich, highly successful imperial power. Um, you know, I think it's India. India is right next door to China, was in a very similar place in the 1970s. Um, mm -hmm. Both very poor countries, mostly rural agrarian. And if you look at the trajectories of, and, and India basically went on the American model, liberal democracy, universal uh, suffer. I mean, in a way, it, it did universal suffrage before getting rich in the way the United States did not. Um, you know, um, uh, raucous, messy, decentralized, heavily federalized democracy. And China did it through in a kind of authoritarian system. And I'm still a deep partisan for democracy. But if you look at that experiment, um, what the Chinese have done for human dignity and living standards and the kind of scourges of disease mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. want in their country, I think is a real challenge to those of us who would say, doesn't matter what the consequences are, always go with democracy. Uh, I mm -hmm. was a reporter mm -hmm. in India for several years. I have seen, and I've also spent time reporting in China, I have seen those villages in India where you are lucky if you escape all the way to your first birthday, right? They have eliminated problems like that in China to a great degree. I, I have seen mm -hmm. the places in India where there's just really no elementary education. And the Chinese really had an educational revolution focusing on uh, primary school, whereas India really focused on higher education to cultivate a kind of more educated elite. Um, and so while I will always defend a liberal democratic uh, order over any alternative, 
I think those of us who want to do that, it's gotten harder with the challenge China has posed, with the contrast yes. with places like India, like the United States, that are nominally liberal democratic, but have strayed so far from the actual practice of those values and institutions, um, that it kind of makes the Chinese alternative look good to a lot of countries around the world. That mm -hmm. used to be a much clearer choice um, yeah. for a lot of places. For, you see it now in a lot of places in Africa and Latin America, it's not a clear choice. They look at these models and it's not just the money and power. It's not just That's the true. Chinese buying them bridges and building stadiums and it is that, but it is also the model, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is looking at an India and looking at a China as, a, as an African head of state and, and making an honest choice about where you want to see your country in 20 years. And we are not helping by yes. befouling our own democracy, such as it is, every day. We are, we are whispering into the ear of every aspiring autocrat or wannabe autocrat or fair-minded leader of a poor country that maybe you should try their way, right? Because yeah. we have lost our own. Um, yeah. And so the conversation that we normally have within this country about democracy and strengthening institutions and inequality, I think it's just important to remind people that it is also a global conversation. Yeah. If we don't really have standing as the United States to defend the idea of liberal democracy because we're not even really adhering to it ourselves, yes. um, the world starts to look very, very dark. And there are real forces in Russia and China elsewhere who are very happy to step in and offer a kind of Beijing consensus model mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to counter the Washington one. And that is, I think, something that has kind of century long um, consequences potentially. Yeah, I about uh, two and a half years ago, I was invited to the Swedish consulate in New York for our luncheon. And all of these people, Swedish uh, economists and former government officials, some of whom I knew, really were putting it, there weren't too many Americans there. And they really put it on me. And they said, in Sweden, we love the robots because we see the potential. But we also know that when there's a transformation of how we produce things to make things better or more efficient, people will have health care, people will have pensions, they will get adjustment assistance, and they are members of the society. So you have a very large consensus within Sweden about what you do for the common good in order to achieve the most productive and vital society and economy you can have. And then they went on about, and you're watching the power of Donald Trump, this was just before the uh, year or so before the election, and you're seeing in America people are terrified of automation, machine learning, what happened to places like Detroit and Cleveland. And recently somebody brought to my attention that I had written something about this, uh, and then Peter Goodman, who wrote the book Davos Man, had written an, an article called We Love the Robots about the character of the characteristics of the Scandinavian collective transfers in order to make change and how it was absent in America. And it was very, um, how would I say, uh, haunting to me when somebody came to me and said, people in West Virginia now, which is not a big group of people, but they're the coal miners, are saying, look at what they did to the Midwest in manufacturing. You all talk in climate change now. Nobody's going to help us. We're going to be losers. We're going to resist it. And as you've emphasized several times, we can't afford to resist climate change. And I always said that Joe Manchin seems to be blocking everything. It would be nice if he had a positive vision of something he could construct to make transformational assistance of the state of West Virginia, which is his home state, and set a new example for America. That could be a very constructive 
element within the Democratic Party. But we just don't seem to be getting off the launching pad of transformation that is inclusive. And yep. and, like I, and I think, said, again, going back to the point about um, organizing, this is a problem of people like Joe Manchin, but I think we fetishize these handful of obstructionist leaders and kind of treat them as uh, alibis for much deeper, mm. deeper problems. I agree. Um, I agree. I don't think we have actually won these arguments among ourselves. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And I mean that in an optimistic way. Um, yes, there are potential some who there. portray something like Medicare for all as being overwhelmingly popular with people, but for our leaders. I actually don't think that's true. I think a very large number of regular people in this country incorrectly fear universal health care as kind of socialized medicine. But to me, that's optimistic because that's an argument we got to have. Yeah. I don't think we've won them over. I think we need yeah. to. Um, but I don't think we've done that work. And it is work. And similarly on climate, it's not just the oil companies blocking. That's a very big part of the story. And they're ginning up all this fake stuff. But, you know, there is a genuine view out in the country of that being left alone uh, by central authorities telling you what to do is the highest form of human existence. And we got we to gotta argue with those people. We got to talk to them. We have to play some things they believe against other things they believe. We can't just say Joe Manchin, Joe Manchin, Joe Manchin right. in a way yes. that lets us off as if we've done all the work uh, right. to lay the groundwork right. for these changes except one guy. We haven't. No. We haven't done that work, uh, and it's very important to do that work and not let yourself off the hook. Uh, 